And when I look back at all the things that I've done in my life, that's really what's been the most important thing to me as to serve. Because ultimately, with this whole, like the life and death and removing yourself from ego, the, the best way to remove yourself or to free yourself from the ego is to serve others. It's, to, it's when we put ourselves at the center and everything that we do is to serve ourselves that life gets harder. That was Dylan Werner, and I'm Henry Winslow. You're listening to Dharma Talk. Dharma Talkers, hello and thank you for tuning in. This week, as always, it's my pleasure to share an interview with a yogi I respect and admire, living his purpose with all his heart. What's different for me, that is, is that this week I'm recording from Puerto Rico because I've just moved out of New York City and begun a new chapter of travel and discovery. Of course, I'll be missing my yoga family in New York, but as Dylan and I discuss in this episode, there's a significant difference between connection and attachment. So I'm reckoning with that balance now, and there's more on differentiating the two to come. But first, please take a moment to subscribe to Dharma Talk if you've not done so already. And if you have, please leave a rating and review makes a huge difference to help support me in this endeavor and get more people listening to the podcast. Also, you can always just share the episode with a friend. If you feel like this could really help someone, then send it over and let them hear it. And of course, if you have the financial means to make a donation, I always appreciate those. It helps to keep this project up and running at a high quality. And now I'd like to say thank you to our generous sponsor this week. This episode is brought to you by Jennifer Brodsky, an avid listener of Dharma Talk. Jennifer serves as a yoga advisor at Pure Yoga NYC, a studio known not only for its world-renowned teachers, but also for the premium Oasis-like experience they offer in busy New York, complete with spa-quality showers, lounges, and other deluxe amenities. Jennifer reached out to me personally, and our conversation naturally turned into a discussion of purpose and dharma. Jennifer knows that to be of service to others will help her align with her purpose, in her words, to make the world a more peaceful place. In her role at Pure Yoga NYC, she's currently able to offer access to yoga, so that's what she's doing. How does a no-strings-attached complimentary yoga class at Pure sound to you? Why not try out these luxurious amenities for yourself? Reach out directly to Jennifer to claim your free class at pureyogadharma at gmail.com. That's pureyogadharma at gmail.com. Do you want to level up your yoga practice? Well, check out the Henry Yoga app, my brand new 40-day, 40 minutes daily program for anyone looking to get serious about yoga. Sign up and get your first two classes free at henryyoga.com. Yogis, I am gearing up for my final set of workshops for 2019, which is going down at the Yoga Dojo in Richmond, Virginia, my hometown. The dates are November 22nd through 24th, and I'll be teaching a combination of rocket yoga classes and backbending workshops that weekend. To get the details for that one, head over to henrywins.com slash events and sign up there. Yogis, if you are looking for the perfect way to wrap up 2019 and lay a golden foundation for a beautiful 2020 to come, then please join me and my wife, Veronica Lombo, for our seven-day retreat to Bali. We're calling it Divine Connection because that's our vision for this retreat, that you'll be able to take the time to step away from your typical environment, step away from your social conditioning and your responsibilities and get honed into the divine light within you. And how do we hope to achieve that? Well, every morning is going to begin with noble silence. This is prime time for self-reflection, self-inquiry and inner work. 
Also, we will have a group meditation every day and two yoga classes, one more rigorous vinyasa class and one more restorative hatha class. We're going to take care of all the food for you. You'll be provided three vegan, plant-based, and refined sugar-free meals a day. And we've also got some exciting adventures and excursions lined up, all included. Basically, we have an amazing experience lined up for you, something totally transformative and empowering. You just have to get yourself to Bali and then we'll take you through the rest. If this sounds appealing, please head over to henrywins.com slash Bali and you can find all the details there. All right, now back to the show. Dylan Werner at Dylan Warner Yoga on Instagram, is an international yoga teacher from Southern California. He pioneers a unique style of vinyasa yoga centered around myofascial meridian sequencing and emphasizes the exploration of a physical journey to deepen the inner energetic connection. His extensive knowledge of anatomy and physiology and deep understanding of Eastern philosophy lend a unique perspective to his teaching methodologies. I was very excited to have this conversation with Dylan. I had never met him in person, so this was the first time we got a chance to speak. But of course, I had seen him out on the internet making a name for himself with very clearly an amazing physical practice, but I could also tell that there was quite a lot of understanding and thoughtfulness beneath that physical practice. So. This conversation was my chance to dive in there and share that mind with you all. We talk about many things, including the darker side of Dharma and the historical use of religion to control people. We talk about moving past the ego through service, through putting others outside yourself in the center of your experience. Dylan also talks about his own approach to training and using physicality as a training tool for the mind and vice versa. And he leaves us with a reflection on the communion between inner nature and outer nature and recognizing the difference between connection or love and attachment. If this episode rings true for you and you'd like to know more, go to dharmatalk.show and type Dylan in the search bar, D-Y-L-A-N, and you'll find all the notes and links for this episode, including Dylan's recommended book. And, of course, you can always find the running list of every book ever recommended on Dharma Talk when you go to henrywins.com slash books. So if you're thinking trying to find a book to read. There's a great reading list right there. Go check it out. Pick one out. Now, without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Dylan Werner. Dylan Werner, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you on. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, You know, we always start with the same opening question, and this tends to give us some insight into what we should talk about. So I figure we'll start right there. The question is, what does the word dharma mean to you, and what is your dharma as you understand it today? It's a, it's a really good question to start. I like, I like this better than uh, how did you start teaching yoga. I think it's, it means a little bit more. Um, and I think the first time I actually heard the word dharma wasn't necessarily from yoga, but more from Buddhism. Uh, and I, I have to admit, I haven't listened to any of your other podcasts uh, or your interviews to see how other people have answered this question. That would be kind of kind of interesting to hear. But when um, so the first time I heard Dharma, it was described as as the the three gems of the Buddha. I don't know if you, I'm sure you're familiar with this, right? Since I am familiar. Yeah. Um, you know, b- before you answer it, I'll just say that most people answer this question more from the the yoga background, the Bhagavad Gita style interpretation of Dharma. But I've had a few Buddhist practitioners who come on and, and talk about the three jewels as well. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that was just like the first one. The Dharma is kind of really the teachings or the path leading up to our greatest potential. You know, it's really like the, the three gems without the, the Dharma, the Sagna, or the Buddha. The, but it's, 
it's kind of like three parts of of a of a pyramid or a teepee like they they all need to be there to be standing need the community which is really the inspiration uh and the dharma which is the teaching to kind of lead us all to our highest highest potential uh but i don't know if i necessarily so it's it's such an interesting word because because it has so many different meanings and so many different people understand it in different ways. And like all things, words, words are just things and they only mean, they only mean something to us because we give it meaning. And this, this is something I actually talk about a lot. And I think about a lot with, with different words like love or fear, or I mean, Dharma is one of those. Uh, it's, we take our entire lives, our childhood, our experiences, our family, and whatever whatever we've done, and we create our subjective truth, our subjective reality around all things, and then we cut that truth with our own li- with our own life. So it doesn't necessarily it's not actually truth anymore once we do that. Which is an interesting thing because I think being a yogi and why I had such a strong attraction to the philosophy of yoga is I, I really thought yoga was about understanding the truth. I still think yoga is about understanding the truth. Uh, why we're here, what is our purpose, which is I think probably one of the biggest definitions of dharma is purpose or duty, uh, which you know I think we're all trying to kind of figure that out why are we here what is the meaning of life and if life only has the meaning that we give it then what does that mean for me and so if i if i create that meaning then i think my dharma really is to share whatever that meaning is because that that's ultimate purpose in life is to share to to grow the community and so then it kind of comes back full circle to the whole Buddhist philosophy of what Dharma is. If that makes any sense, I don't know. I'm kind of, there's, there's so many different ways we could think of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I find that the more we look at different interpretations from different schools of thought around these big ideas, even when at first blush or like the superficial level, they seem to have different meanings. You can, tease them back to some sort of universal truth. And, you know, if, if yoga says the Dharma is our purpose or that it's our duty or role to play. And in Buddhism, it's about a teaching that brings us to our highest potential. Like where can we look for the overlap there and see what that really says? I always find that, you know, when different, different lineages reach a similar conclusion, that tells me something about getting close. Yes. I mean, Truth is always going to be subjective and objective truth may be impossible to reach, but that's a little bit closer to objective when multiple right. schools agree. Yeah, this, this is something that I've been, the, the whole truth thing that I've been talking about and sharing in, in my workshops and in my writings and everything is about the understanding of truth, the subjective, the objective. And as um, uh, you all know, Harari talks about a lot in his books, the, the inner subjective which is a really interesting thing to talk about. I don't know if you've read any uh, Sapiens or Homo Deus or any of those books. I read Sapiens. I haven't read any of his other work. They're they're all pretty good. It's all kind of talking about the same thing. Um, well, yeah, I think that all essentially the underlying message is all the, is all the same. But the, there's he mentions in there these three different types of truths, and I think. It was the first time I really started thinking about intersubjective truth, which is um, intersubjective truth just means if we all believe in it, then it's true. But it's only true because we believe in it. So things like countries, borders, money, even titles, these are all things that uh, mm-hmm. that once we stop believing in it, they're, they no longer exist. So, you know, I'm in London right now, and right now mm-hmm. London – or at least the UK is part of the EU. And that's about 
or could change here pretty quick at the end of the month. If anybody follows world politics and they, they've been following Brexit and stuff, it's a pretty big thing over here. Uh, yeah. You know, so there's, there's a lot of things that could change just by policy that, that changes in the truth of what we believe in. But the really interesting thing when we, we come back to what truth is, the, the ultimate idea of truth and yoga being union and connection, and I think this is really the, the absence of separation, uh, to understand that there is no separation between things is the ultimate truth, that when we look at intersubject truth, that every single intersubjective truth is actually something that creates separation. So countries create separation, borders, you know, money creates separation, even things like titles like doctor or lawyer. They, these are things that separate somebody from something else based on some sort of criteria. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's there's one way to look at it, which is all of these inner subjective truths, these things that we collectively agree to and ascribe meaning to based on our agreement. They establish rules for us to be able to talk about the thing that is all one, right? It gives us some sort of language to to just operate within the higher level truth of the absence of separation. But we can also get so wrapped up in it that it overcomes our understanding of the higher level truth. And that's, I think where it gets right. dangerous. And, and as we were kind of mentioned before, like with the subjective truth or or we even know objective truth, which is, I, I really believe is an impossibility, but as close as we could come is to understand that we are seeing things as we are, no matter how hard we try to see things as, as, as is, you know, to, truly remove ourselves from the picture is an impossibility because we're the ones seeing, you know, it's, um, I don't know, maybe that that's kind of the, the pathway, the goal, or maybe some people have got there where they're able to truly remove themselves from ego and no longer have the subjective experience. But, uh, I know at least in my journey, that's something that is so far, so far away from being completely, uh, removed from from the ego, and also I think part of my ego in there doesn't doesn't want to remove the I from existence. And I think uh, the the pathways that we see with with a lot of Eastern religions, you know, Buddhism especially is, and and, and yoga as well, but especially Buddhism is about removing the I or as, ascending this. Because that when we remove ego in the sense of I, the transition towards death or the, the ultimate, you know, the end of our life is a lot easier to accept when we, when we don't put ourselves in that. It's kind of like, I don't know, I've been thinking a lot about like death and stuff lately or more than, more than probably normal uh, with the, just understanding mortality and, and how do we, live life and approach it. And, um, I don't know if you've ever read, uh, Siddhartha, um, the story of the Buddha. Yeah. I actually have not read that book, but, um, but I also think it's important to consider death. I think it should be part of, well, I don't know if I say should, I should say should, but to me, it's an important part of my contemplation practice. What led you to start talk or to start thinking more about mortality and maybe that's where you're going with yeah. the reference to Siddhartha. Yeah. Well, I think it, it, in the Buddha's case, when, cause the Buddha was, or the story of the Buddha anyways, was he was a, a prince and he was kind of like subjected to the palace and was, wasn't able to go out and see the world so much and just was like fed philosophy and everything. And then one day he kind of escaped from the palace and went out and he saw sick people and dying people and, and all these things. And he had all these, the, these questions, which were like, you know, how can we ever truly be happy if we know that we're going to be sick or how can we ever truly be happy if we know that we're going to die? If this is our ultimate faith, how are we able to live our lives in a, in a free way? And there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of different 
ways that people look at like what's the meaning of life or or what we what are we trying to accomplish in our life as far as a feeling or an emotion and one you know a lot of people would would say that life is about being happy or at least as far as like moving through life to feel happy or another way to say it is life is about uh alleviating suffering in yourself and in the world and and all things one of my teachers he, uh, a very wise person, Shiva Das, he, he talks about, you know, what, what we all need in life is, is really the feeling of being whole and kind of everything that we do is, is to this, to feel like we're whole. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of my life, uh, of growing up and, that I, I, f I felt more like I had a hole in my life that needed to be filled with something rather than f feeling whole. And so I was always out trying to pursue different things to kind of fill whatever that was in my life that was missing. And I, I still, like, as I look around and I observe people and I listen and have conversations, a, l a lot of the world is really out there just trying to fill their hole in their life with something else instead of realizing that their life is already whole or complete. And this, this comes, I think, more to the understanding of that it's not yourself that it's whole, but it's really this understanding of being a part of something greater and, and bigger. I don't know. And so somewhere in there, like, I feel like the, the struggle with like, okay, well, I'm a, a part of all this and I really believe that we all share like kind of this, the same universal energy. And as we started as energy and we expressed ourselves as energy and form, and some of that energy is expressed as emotions. And, and then we try to create stories to figure out what those emotions are and what this form is and that those things aren't necessarily truth, but the net, the necessity of us needing to understand that this is supposed to make sense when the, as a, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says it's the universe isn't under any obligation to make sense to you. Yeah. <laughs> but yet we feel as though we need, we need this understanding and it, it puts you in a, in a place of like, you know, maybe this doesn't make sense. And what makes my existence is, is simply my memory that I understand and remember yesterday and I could think about tomorrow and all my ego and all that is attached to this memory. And as soon as, as my life stops, what happens to that memory? You know, and I, th I think that's, that's really where the, the ego lies and where a lot of the questions of the afterlife, yeah, maybe we're reincarnated into something else. Maybe we just go back to energy. Maybe there's uh, some man in the sky or, you know, some dude with horns, that, uh, you know, whatever, whatever your version of the afterlife, if there is one or not, it's does the memory of your life here and your experience go with that? And what we are attached to is not necessarily the life that we live or continuing that, but it's the memories that have created our identity and who we are. Yeah, that is, that is the powerful question. I mean, even if, even if we can all accept, let's, let's just say that everyone accepts that we move on to another life, we reincarnate. If we don't carry on our old memories from this life, then is it really even material that we reincarnated? I mean, it's like starting over from total scratch and you're, you wind up with the same sense of mystery, same concern and anxiety over what comes at death at that point. Cause you don't remember the last reincarnation. Right. So the cycle repeats. So, what, so, so what's the point? What's, what's the purpose? Yeah. Well, if you know, you referenced Neil deGrasse Tyson, he said, if, he says the universe has no obligation to explain itself to us. Was that the quote? Uh, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to us. To make sense to us. Yeah. Right. Well, then if, if that's true, which <laughs> I mean, I agree, um, then perhaps the point is to marvel and to wonder at the mystery. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think what we do in this life is really 
you know, we try to make sense of it because to be human is to be naturally inquisitive and to want to answer these questions. And of course, to want to find our purpose, our, our, our Dharma, um, you know, religion, especially like the, the, in the Hindu, or at least uh, like old Hindu religion, or which is really just a, a, a bunch of religions together, but they use this, this word Dharma so much as a form of control to the people. And so I think, it, you know, even to think about purpose in the sense of Dharma in that way, it's, uh, it's a really almost a dark word. Mm, this is interesting. Yeah, let's go down this thread. <laughs> uh, have you have you talked about this before in, in in a while? I'm sure you have. You've had to like. I I don't think there this conversation has come up around it being a dark word meant to control people into, you know, perpetuating their their position in society. But this is this is really interesting, and it's you cannot divorce the teachings from the context in which they came up, and that was certainly a factor then with the caste system and all of that. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of one of the things that I have a problem with a lot of religions and stuff in there. And of course, like even I'm, I'm not a religious person now. I'm not a, I, I don't have any faith or believe in any faith, but I, I, I used to have, have a faith, which is, which is an interesting word in itself when we talk about God, faith. Uh, but you know, one of the things that's beautiful is we're, I was thinking about this actually yesterday I was scrolling through Instagram and I was looking at some different teachers on how they teach things and how they teach things so different than the way that I would teach them or that I do teach them. And of course, as, as any teacher, you know, you're a teacher, you teach what you teach because you have a strong belief in what you're teaching is the best way. Mm -hmm. But one of the beautiful things about having so many teachers is that there's there's a lot of different ways to do different things and it all comes from some sort of practice uh it it, it comes from your own own experience to do that so i i really i really respect everybody's ideas to believe whatever they want or to teach whatever they, they want and this is again all of our own unique subjective experience where we're just inserting ourselves into reality and in whatever way that we fit. But so, um, yeah, coming from somebody that used to be religious to not, I, I definitely see religion in, in a very different way. And uh, before I offend a lot of people, I think there is a, a, a difference between people that are religious and people that have faith or believe in God. Because if there is a God, then that all comes from God or whatever higher power. And religion is something that comes from man, something that we created. You know, so is that we just, again, it's us trying to explain how our form is being expressed in this universe you know how how is it and where are these answers and so we we make up stories or maybe stories came from a divine way or whatever but somewhere in there a lot of these religions and they're not all right because they they all well, a lot of them contradicts each other in a certain way but a lot of them were really used especially historically to control the people mm -hmm. and and Hinduism with, with the different caste systems was definitely one of those. And the, the Dharma was one of the ways that, that was used the most to control people. And so they thought of it as like, if you're in a lower caste and I don't know if you, if I'm going to do lots of name dropping, but most of these people are dead that I name drop. Uh, <laughs> um, but like Joseph Campbell, he's, he's yeah. one of my, my favorite people to like, read and listen to his, his old talks. He, he talks about yeah. the caste system in India is basically being like, uh, like high school, like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior for, for the Americans listening. I, I, I realize now cause I'm hardly ever in the States 
and a lot of my audience is outside of America that we that not everybody understands American culture, you know, you think they would with, with all the TV and stuff. But uh, yeah, so like when you're a freshman in high school, you know that you're going to get hazed and picked on and it's just kind of comes with the territory. When I was in the military, my first six months or a year is kind of being new and, and a lower rank, they, there's a lot of hazing, or at least there was in, back in 99. And then um, when I was a firefighter, you know, going through the probationary year, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's going to be shitty. Like life, it's, it's going to suck because that's kind of, in, in to use the word again, that's your dharma for your duty in that role. Like as a probationary firefighter, you're you have to be the first one to wake up, make the coffee, clean the toilets, empty the dishwasher, all the shit that no one else wants to do, you have to do because it's it's your duty at that time. But you do it because you know it's not always going to be your duty. And the way that this was used so much back then in, in controlling the people is that, that if you were in a lower caste, you had to do the, the crap your jobs because that was your duty. But it was okay because you're going to come back. And again, this is really uh, – I'm quoting a lot of, uh, or misquoting probably, or, uh, Joseph Campbell is, as how he explains it, but it, it was okay because you're going to come back as a sophomore the next year, or as a junior the next year, the saint, you know, as you make your way up to the, the, the Brahmin cast or, um, the, ne- the next year in this case, meaning your next reincarnation, yeah, your next life, your next reincarnation. But yeah. you only get that if you did your Dharma, if you did your duty. Yeah. So this this is how you ascended up through it as as you come back. As so, as, it didn't matter what your dharma was, and the Bhagavad Gita talks about this a lot too. As well as it's like you you whatever your duty is, whatever your dharma is, you do it with your whole heart, uh, which is kind of the message. And and when so when the, the dharma is given to you, that's. I think that's where we get into trouble. And if we think that our duty could come from someone else, anyone else other than ourselves, we're being controlled. Especially when we're told like, okay, this is your Dharma and you need to do it. You're like, well, why is this my Dharma and who told me and who are you to give me this Mm -hmm. versus, you know, I think one of the hardest things in life for most people's is really to find out what is, what is my meaning? You know, what, what am I here for? What am I here to do? Like, and because I, you know, that leave, uh, leave the world a better place and then how it was from when you came or mm-hmm. however that quote is. I think that most people are, are trying to do that. We're trying to leave the world a better place. And we do that by sharing our dharma. Yeah, from the Bhagavad Gita, I, I do like the part about you should give your whole heart into whatever it is that you do. The the part that's a little more difficult to swallow is that it can be ascribed to you without your consent or without your deep internal knowing that that you want to, and. They, they kind of catch 22 at that is how are you supposed to give your whole heart into something that you don't have your heart in? It's like chicken or the egg. It's impossible to give your heart into something that, that you don't choose, I think. And what comes with that is that there's going to necessarily be an evolving understanding of that. I mean, l- look at you. I mean, you were in the Marines, you're a firefighter, you're a pastor and all of that. It, correct me if I'm wrong was before you even started teaching yoga. And, and now you're doing this thing that you can share with total heart. And maybe you shared those other things with heart too, but at a certain point it was time to move on. Yeah. And, and, and for me, a lot of, a lot of the moving on was chosen for me. Uh, oh, interesting. You know, when I, when I was like for being a firefighter, I had lost my job. It wasn't a choice to, to go from firefighter to yoga. I mean, it eventually was a choice, but after I got laid off, then it was like, okay, well, what do I do? I always wanted to be a yoga teacher, but I wasn't, I didn't have enough courage to leave my, my 
good paying job to go out and and struggle as a yoga teacher. Not that I struggle now. I, I don't. Uh, I, I struggle, but I struggle with different things. Not not mm-hmm. the. I don't have to hustle and teach a million classes anymore. But um, but you did yeah. for a time. Yeah, which is like you could think of it the same way. And and when I was, it the 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 funny thing though, kind of staying on on the same vein, is when I started teaching yoga all the yoga teachers that I knew all taught that were, this is in LA and and I'm sure it's exact same in New York for most people, but they are teaching a ton of classes and a ton of privates and, and that's how they made their money and that's how they got by. And that's all I saw. So I didn't really see like, okay, this was the step to traveling and teaching workshops or towards teaching teacher trainings or whatever, or online content that's, even, I actually started doing online content way back when with uh, with Yogi's Anonymous, but it was a, it was like not a viable source of income. So this was just like what you did, and I chose that. I was like, okay, this is this is what it is, and this is actually what I really want to do. And I always thought of yoga as, as a service. And when I look back at all the things that I've done in my life, that's really what's been the most important thing to me as to serve. Um, cause ultimately with this whole, like the life and death and removing yourself from ego, the, the best way to remove yourself or to free yourself from the ego is to serve others. It's to, it's when we put ourselves at the center and everything that we do is to serve ourselves that life gets harder. But when we put other people in the center of that story that we remove ourselves from, from the center, and then it's, it's much easier to move past the ego and I think the people that have that have had the easiest time leaving this life at, at the end when it's time to go are the ones that have spent their life serving others because they're not attached to their own life. They mm-hmm. you know, and so when I was in the Marines, even though at eighteen years old I wasn't quite sure why I joined the Marine Corps, but Definitely when I became a firefighter and when I became a paramedic, it was something of service and to help others. And then as, as a yoga teacher, when I moved into that, it's all been about serving and helping others. And so I, I feel like even though when I look at, at my, my dharma, the face of that has changed or at least what you you look at all these other things, even when like the short time I was a youth pastor, it was still for service, you know, um, it's always been the same. I've always been doing the same thing. Well, when you look at it with the inner subjective truth, I, they look like different things, but when you get to the essence of it, that's where it's the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'll tell you what, I, I love serving as a yoga teacher so much more than anything else I've, I've ever done. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing to be able to do this and to be in the place that I am. Dylan, you know, a lot of people see, like, if they follow you on Instagram or they see, you know, pictures of you or videos of you, then they see that you have very advanced asanas. But I know that all, all that's... Photoshopped. I just, yeah, it's all fake. It's all fake, right? It's all fake. I just, what I, what I do is I, I use ropes and stuff and I hold on to them and then I just Photoshop the ropes out. Yeah. Yeah. And all the green uh, screens. Yeah. It's very Hollywood. I'm very good at that stuff. Yeah. Well, that's what it takes to be a yoga teacher in LA, right? Yes. You, you have to be able to do one arm handstand to teach yoga. No, I meant the, the rigging up the ropes, but yeah, oh, you probably yeah. need, probably need the one arm handstand also. Yeah, or at least fake. You need to be able to fake a one-arm handstand. Exactly. It's very important. Uh, well, what I was going to ask, actually, <laughs> is, uh, you know, I know that that isn't what's the primary goal in, in your frame of mind. So what is it that you are trying to teach? If you had to distill your main message down, and I know that it changes over time, but currently, what are you trying to teach people when you go around all over the world teaching these workshops? I think with, well, with every workshop, 
depending on what it is, it kind of comes with a different message. So the way that I, I teach a workshop, well, first of all, to get, like, get back to what, why I, I love yoga and why I didn't just go into the calisthenics or gymnastics or something else like that. Mm-hmm. Because I, I really think yoga is the understanding that it's all one, you know, the, the mind, the body and the nature the spirit or, or whatever you want to call it, that there isn't a separation between those things. And as we move through and we, we practice our tapas, all, all those build together. So when you strengthen the body and you do your physical practice, it strengthens the mind as well. And in fact, when we really do something that is, is very physical it makes the training of the mind easy, which in a way d- it doesn't allow the mind to really grow a lot. But at least for myself is when I came into yoga, I couldn't meditate. I had a really hard time being present. I couldn't be silent in any way. My mind always wanted to be anywhere else other than here. And I was, I was addicted to not being here. And the physical practice, and it wasn't just the physical practice, but it was the physical practice with the intention. And so when I when I combined those two things, I always did physical things. Whether I was I, you know, I was a wrestler, a rock climber, I used to run, and but it was when I when I took those two things, the, the physical practice with the intention to be present, that I was able to start to understand the the unification of all things, or at least understand the truth that they always have been that way. And I, for me to get to that level through the physical practice, my physical practice needed to be really strong. And I, I believe that the stronger your physical practice is, it doesn't, and, and that's all subjective to what is challenging for you. Uh-huh. So yeah. for me, I needed something that was challenging, which for a lot of people looks like, really, really physical, but it, it's just my experience. And, you know, this morning I, I woke up and I start my day with like a little bit of, uh, elasticity work, just stretching, moving. And then I move into like my handstand routine, which I, I start the routine with 50 handstands, like, and then a bunch of one arm training. And I, I go through all these things where, maybe a few years ago it would have been super difficult f- for me, but because I've been doing it so long, it's, it's actually not that challenging, you know? So I, I continue to push myself more cause it allows me to focus more on my mind in an easier way. And my, my other practice of, of meditation where the body is completely still, it makes it really challenging to on the mind. Mm-hmm. And so wherever there's more challenge, there's going to be more growth. But like anybody starting something, you start at a, at a beginner level. And for me, it was the being really strong or having a really strong physical practice was the beginner level for the meditation practice, for the mind to be able to be present and calm itself. And without using those things as a tool, I don't think I could ever have made my made my way towards uh, meditation practice, which I think is, you know, it's, it's the, both of those have the qualities of stira and sukha. There's, there's an ease and an, and an effort and they offset each other. So the more challenge you have in the body, the more easy you have in the mind and the more easy you have in the body, the more challenge you have in the mind. And f- so for me, it's, not necessarily important of, of what the practice is, but it's what are the tools that you need to get you through the, the places that you have the most challenge or the most limitations or the most resistance to. And that for me, that just manifested as a really strong physical practice until I was able to move towards a meditation practice. And now I could say it's not quite 50-50, as far as my meditation to my physical practice, I think I still spend more time in a physical practice than a meditative practice. But as far as like seated meditation versus physical asana or handstand training or whatever that is. Mm-hmm. But uh, 
ultimately between the two practices, I'm working towards the same goal. And so in, in my workshops, what I teach are tools and, and that's it. There's every pose is a tool. It's not a destination. It's not a goal. It doesn't do anything unless you know how to use it. And even if you're moving, if you move through alignment and you think of a warrior one, I, there's no purpose of that shape other than what that shape does for the body. And ultimately, what does that shape do for the mind as well? Or for, for any pose, for any journey when we, when we come into that. So I, I don't know. I guess my, my main message to people is to understand the intention behind everything that you do. And when you truly understand that intention, then it comes with a purpose and then you're able to use it in a way to bring you to the place that you ultimately want to go. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, that sounds good, right? That's, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's very well said. Uh, there's, there's the physical plane and there's the mental plane. And I, I'm right with you with using a physical practice as a way to basically force your mind into stillness. I've experienced that. I'm sure many people listening have experienced that, but yeah, you have a very strong physical practice. Thank you. Um, but you know, there's, there's another layer also, um, there's physical and there's mental and well, depending on how you interpret it, maybe you consider this to be part of physical or part of mental, but there's the energy layer too. Um, right. how, how does that fit into your teaching? How do you consider that? So I use the energy, there's so many different ways to, to kind of talk about this. And I think this really comes from people's experience and their definition of words and the meaning that they give to those words. But I used to call it spirit and I've moved away from spirit because it doesn't, doesn't have uh, an emotional connection for me as nature does. So if I were to talk about the, the body in, in, or the self in, in three different planes, it'd be physical, mental, and the mental would be emotional, all that stuff. And then the nature and ultimately, uh, even if you take nature and you break nature down into three parts, we have our the outer nature, which is the environment and everything that surrounds us. And you and I right now are not really surrounded by nature. You know, you being in, in New York in the city and, and me in London, there it's, it's hard to find actual nature. And what we see is just kind of things that separate us from nature. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, I think, why I spend so much time and so much effort to go out into nature and to take long vacations in nature where I'm able to be there and meditate. Because after outer nature is the inner nature. And the inner nature is, is the understanding that the outer nature and our, is the same as our inner nature, that there's not really a difference as Alan Watts says, you know, we, we came into this world like, or we don't come into this world, we, we came out of this world like leaves from a tree. And if we start to see ourselves as nature itself, then we, we feel the communion between the two and we don't feel separate. I think a lot of us feel separate and we've created the separation and we see it as we've kind of destroyed our planet and our environment because we treat the planet like a resource rather than, you know, we, we wouldn't, could you imagine if we treated our friends and family and loved ones like we treated the planet, like just something that has something to give us? Yeah. Or even, you know, or even ourselves. I mean, or even ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and so it gives way to the third nature, which is source nature, or true nature. And, and this is really, I think the, the unification of inner nature and outer nature with the mind and the body, when we bring those all together, then we're, we're really moving towards source nature or towards this universal energy or, of, or at least as what we understand is not to the, the idea the non-dualistic you know, because as, as they would say, they, um, it's not that we're all one because anytime that you say one, we're drawing a line in the sand, but it's that we're not two. And this is really when we understand our connection to all things. And it's, 
I, I had a hard time coming into yoga to the to understand non attachment and connection because I I think for me the meaning of the words of connection and attachment were almost the same thing. You know, how can you be connected to something without being attached to it? And and this is something that really from spending time in nature and uh, the the first vision quest that I did in Sweden, where I spent like um, a good amount of time just sitting in the, in the forest by myself meditating is when I really felt the difference. Like when I, when I knew, when I knew the difference between attachment and connection that didn't come from a definition or words or something that could be explained, but I could actually feel it. Mm. And what, what, you know, what, what was that? <laughs> and not that you can explain can, it fully in words, but yeah, it's, I mean, I could I could explain it in words, but you can't understand it in words. Yeah, and I th I think this people have a hard time with this because you know, we're we're attached to things that we love and to things that make us happy, and so when we lose those things, suffering comes from it, and and this is really one of the roots of, of all suffering. The Buddha said, you know, there's the uh, two things that cause suffering is, is wanting what you don't have and, and not wanting what you do have. Mm -hmm. And so when we lose what we have, you know, whether it's a f someone that we love, a family member, or even, even if it's a separation, you no longer see somebody, the attachment is that person making us happy. And so we want things to stay the same that we want that person or that thing or whatever it is, what it could be money. You know, I have money in my bank. I want to keep that money in my bank because that money in my bank makes me happy. But if I lose all that money for whatever reason, now things are different. The, the, the fundamental law of nature is that everything is continuously changing. And in that, because everything is continuously changing, you can't be attached to anything without ultimately moving into a place of suffering because eventually you're going to, that you wanting that thing to stay the same is not going to stay the same because it can't because everything changes. But connection is, is, is understanding how everything works together in flow. And it's continuously changing and moving, and it does that in this perfect harmony. And that we, it's not that we need to hold on to how it is, that, but we're a part of how it is. Mm -hmm. And so we're a part of this flow and this continuous change. One, one of my other teachers said uh, the difference between love and attachment. And I, and I always think this is love, connection is another word for love. But the difference between love and attachment is love is you wanting someone to be happy and attachment is you wanting them to make you happy. Mm. And I think we, we really confuse these two things. But once – I'm not going to say that I've moved past attachment. I don't have attachments to certain things. If I lost – I don't have a lot of things. I live out of a suitcase. You know, but I have some things. And if I lost my computer, I'm attached to having my computer and all the things on to, on it. I'd probably be pretty sad about that, you know, to lose all my photos and everything. You know, so I'm definitely not beyond attachment or family members. If any of my family members were to pass on, I'd, I'd be sad. I think that's a very human thing. But also in that, I understand that that attachment is only going to come with suffering. But one of the things that this practices understanding has led to and is, which is especially important in my life is not missing people so much uh, because I'm always on the road and and changing if I if I was attached to all the people that I was around I would be constantly missing people which would in in turn not allow me to enjoy wherever I am or to be connected uh, to the experience that I'm having what other ways has this deeper understanding of the difference between connection or love and attachment practically improved your lifestyle? I think the well relationships definitely, and even one, um, you know, I, uh, there's, I have an, uh, an ex-girlfriend that I, I, I greatly love and, you know, 
would love to have a relationship with her, but it doesn't work out or it's not working out in that way. And I think, uh, you know, the, the attachment to it makes it so that I want her in my life because that would make me happy. Or at least, you know, that's the idea. I, I think I'd be happy, but, but it's the love that actually allows me to understand that I, I'd rather her be happy and do what she needs to do rather than me be happy because having her in my life would make me happier. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, that's a hard thing to really understand if you don't understand the difference between those two things or to actually, despite, you know, the, the illusion of separation between the two of us that her being happy will ultimately also make me happy, whether it's with me or not, because I love her. Right. There's, there's that aphorism. Like if you love something, set it free. It's essentially that, Yeah. but yeah, there's, there's peace and, but, but without the desire for it to come back. What's that? Say that again. You know, without without the desire for it to come back if you love something set yeah. it free and that you know it like goes on then if it if it's meant to be it'll come uh, back to you yeah but yeah but without that if you love it just let it that's not even setting it free because that's like that gives you the idea that you you had it in the first mm -hmm. place or that even more that that you were attached to it that, or that you could let it go but the, the letting go there, the letting go there is more of, of your mind, right? Like in your mind, letting the person or it go because your right. attachment is, is not true. It's not physical. It's not tangible, but if it's keeping you mentally attached to this idea or person, then it's more really enslaving you than the person. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's, again, it's coming into that understanding of what the ultimate truth is when we remove ourselves from, from the one being, or at least our idea of being the only one experiencing truth or that truth is the only thing that happens because we experience it. If that makes any sense at all. It makes it made sense in my mind. It makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah. Sense, right? I mean, that's, that's a, that's a key teaching so of, of Buddhism, of right? The, like karma and emptiness. Like we, we are projecting our ideas onto the things that we see as being outside of ourselves, but they only exist in the unique way that we perceive them because of what we bring to the table. Exactly. Well, I think we should start wrapping up because we're running out of time. But before we head into the final section of the interview, I want to make sure um, that people know how to study with you, learn more from you uh, if they're resonating with what, with, what, with what you're saying. So what do you have you got coming up? Um, teacher trainings, workshops, anything like that? Uh, it's my, my, my teacher trainings is such a, a bittersweet thing for me. I, I love doing them and I love teaching them. And I only do one 200 hour and one 300 hour a year. And the entire time I'm traveling around and teaching, people are, are asking about them. And I, my, my thing is like sign up for my mailing list, which is on my website, which I guess is a good time, dylanwarneryoga.com. So you sign up there. But I only, only release these teacher trainings once a year. And I just released it uh, two days ago, three days ago, something like that. And sent it out to my mailing list. And the 300 sold out in like 75 minutes. Wow. And the 200 sold out in just under three hours. So there's all these people that wait a whole year and then, um, and then it goes so quick. Yeah. Wow. Well, so people, if uh, they want to do it, then they just got to get in the line <laughs> basically get, get, on, get on the mailing list. Yeah. I, I feel bad because one of the things that I've always thought about yoga, and if you, if you take one of my workshops, chances are it's going to be super, super packed and there's, there's a good and, and bad about that like the good part is with my workshops is I really try hard not to turn anybody away because I want it to be an inclusive experience and 
of course, it'd be nicer if there's more space for everybody to come, but that, then that means that someone else can't come or that someone might be you, that you can't come because it, it's sold out. So, mm-hmm. so with those, I try to get as many people in to have the experience and maybe it's a little bit less experience than they'd have if there's only 20 people versus a hundred people. But I, I stay as long after to give everybody as, as much of my time as I possibly can. But with my trainings, I keep them, I keep them small because it's really important to have that one-on-one time and experience. Uh, yeah, so I, th- I think the best thing is to, to see me or tr- to train with me online. I do a lot of stuff on Alamoves, yeah, alamoves.com or it's uh, an, an app. I'm actually going out in November to film some some more stuff, more content, but that's probably the most accessible way to train with me is Got online. I'm, I'm planning on, on doing some free stuff, or at least that's my hopes with all the other stuff I have going on, but trying to do some stuff on YouTube, some classes and, and little stuff like that. So that people that don't have any money, even though Alan moves is like 20 bucks a month for unlimited everything. It's, but even for some people that's uh, outside mm-hmm. of their budget. So I'm um, going to, try to get more free stuff out there as well. Right on. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, well, okay, let's, let's move on to the final section of this interview. I close all these interviews with what I call the prana round. So I'm going to ask you six rapid fire questions and you answer minimum one word, maximum one sentence. Okay. Okay. All right. In one word, why do you practice yoga? Connection. What's Uh, your favorite? (laughs) <laughs> you want to change it's it? So hard. It's so hard to say that in one word. Yeah, connection. But I'd also say truth or 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 yeah, dude. That's such hard. Uh, we'll go with connection. We'll, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, this is rapid fire. This is such an unfair thing to do. Go ahead. All right. Next one. <laughs> What's your favorite yoga pose and why? The one that brings me to whatever I need. Nice. What's the single best cue or piece of advice that you've received from a yoga teacher? Uh, this is all made up. This is all made up? Yeah, talk, he's talking about poses. All these poses that we do, they're all made up by somebody. And, and the idea is like um, we take things so so serious or we move so much into the dogma of a certain pose or certain alignment and we really just got to remember that yoga was made up by somebody these yeah. poses were made up by somebody and that yeah cool it's not, it's who said that up. uh that was cameron shane okay said that yeah all right recommend said it in a different way i don't know if you know cameron shane but he's a bit more colorful he's a bit more colorful with the things that he says but yeah that's <laughs> I can use my imagination. Yeah. But that was the basic idea. Yeah. Yeah. Like don't take this, basically don't take this shit serious. Somebody fucking made this up or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, sometimes those, uh, those more artistic words kind of help to drive a point home. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Recommend one book can be modern or ancient for our audience. And you've already mentioned a few. Um, there was uh, Sapiens, uh, Siddhartha, but you can point to one of those or propose something else. Oh, let's see. What, what is a good... Uh, here's a really good one that, that I love. Um, it's called Being Nobody Going Nowhere by Ayakema. It's a, it's okay. a good Buddhist book, but something that is really easy to understand and uh yeah really good one being nobody going nowhere being nobody going nowhere okay is yoga for everyone yes yes okay last question dylan how can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you in your dharma uh so get in touch with me i don't know (laughs) why do you even want to get in touch with me is a better question (laughs) what what is what is what's the, I don't know, I think the easiest way to kind of see what's going on with me in my life is, is follow me on Instagram and yeah, write me or message me there. I, 
I don't spend a lot of time as much time on social media or in emails or as other things because I, I've found as I've gone through this journey that that the more people that follow me and the more people that write me, the the less time that I have to actually experience and to learn and to grow and to share. And so uh, I try to I try to stay away from a, a lot of different forms of media as much as I can. Um, the low media so, diet. Yeah. I think I'm that's smart. Media, I, yeah. I don't know if you, you notice like I, I don't respond to emails very quick and, <laughs> and so no, that's yeah, good. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> that's good. The best thing is to follow me on Instagram. I, I appreciate it when people read the stuff that I write. Cause I do try to put some thought into it most of the time. I'm not always the most thoughtful person. Uh, and I really, I really, I read all the comments though. I don't, reply to all of them. I, I, I love hearing what people have to say and, and how people put their subjective experience into my subjective experience. You know, it's kind of this beautiful blending that goes on there. Right on. Well, Dylan, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me. I think it was fruitful and gave me a lot to chew on personally. I hope the listeners feel the same way. And, um, yeah, thank you. I and I hope you have a great time in London. Thank you. It was a uh, yeah, great talking with you. Dharma talkers, I hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. And if you did, please share it. Take a screenshot, share it on Instagram, and tag me at Henry Wins. I love hearing from you about the conversations that make an impact for you. We have the ability to shape the world through our thoughts, words, and conversation. So let's influence the collective consciousness together. All my gratitude to Rory Wagstaff of Ease of Mind Productions for keeping our audio crisp and operations smooth, and to Patrick Kiebzak of Momentology Music and Art for supplying the powerful soundtrack to these conversations. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review, and tune in to new episodes of Dharma Talk every Thursday. I'll speak to you next week, and until then, keep living your Dharma.